If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. Yeah, this is Houston. We're copying. Uh, everything is go here. We shall fight on the beaches and in the streets. We shall never surrender. I'm in it just to rewrite history Cause I'm in the mood to Label us the leaders of the leaders of the new school This ain't for the radio Can't find this on YouTube This the type of killing that these critics say used to You're a group of happy rebels You've said no to the rules of the game Or the regulations of the day You've said no to the conventional wisdom You're all originals In this day and age I got time for innovation Time to be creative Time to Welcome to the 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast with Jeremy Barker, where we dream big and challenge the conventional wisdom. This podcast is about distilling the lessons we've learned in life and business and turning them into tools to help you succeed personally and professionally. We're about standing firm, running toward the battle, building communities, changing the game and staking our claim. Today, we're here with Curtis Leishman. He's the vice president of Murphy Door. He's the guy that I've trusted and has been with me since the very beginning. Amazing young man, of course. He looks cuter than me. He's shorter, so that's the one thing he's got lesser. But everything else, Curtis swings bigger, as we learned playing a little bit of top golf and tearing my bicep trying to show him up. He may seem small in stature, but he's as big a person as you'll ever want to talk to. Learned a lot from this guy, and I'm really excited. We've covered a lot of things about how we started Murphy Door, the struggles we've had, what it did to our family, and how we worked through it, and hopefully heading in the right direction. So I hope you enjoyed this time today with Curtis Leishman and uh, me. Thanks for tuning in. Well, guys, here we are again. Awesome Curtis Leishman with me. Yes. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you notice how sexy he is. We can always count on Curtis to wear something really, really elaborate to yep. break up the monotony of me. Yeah, I'm kind of into clothes, but uh, not fancy clothes. I should probably have a portion of stock in Ross Dress for Less because that's my place to go. I'm just surprised you're not wearing Asian today. Mm -hmm. He's, he has the best Asian outfits. They're beautiful. Tiger, tiger jumpsuits. Oh, yeah. And dragon jackets and... You'll Just have the opportunity one time. Ken. One time. Yeah, I got to say, I really want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> and when he shows up to a trade show like that, something else. It's an eye catcher. Hey, well, we thought we'd bring him in today. I mean, Curtis and I were initially, when we met, I'm going to roll back, but we, he helped me start Murphy Door together. So to roll in, but there was a unique relationship. And I don't know what it is. He said something about he was the first one to stick my wife. I didn't know what that meant, but he yeah. met with an IV. Mm -hmm. So that was weird. So then my wife came home and she said, hey, you got to meet this guy. He's in fire class with you. So we went in fire class, got to finally, I thought, you know, if my wife has this crush on Curtis, I better get to know him because it'll be weird if I know. Yeah. I don't know if it was really a crush, but we're going to pretend. It was. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, I think you came up to Morgan on a class and then we went on this ambulance call or something and somebody, yeah. we were in a burn trailer training, I think. And right there off the freeway, this car launched off the freeway yep. right into our fire training class. Yep. That was weird. Yeah. The funny thing about that story that I still remember when that car flew off the freeway onto that training spot, kind of where we were, is that you have a class full of 30 people trying to become firefighters and volunteers. And uh, this car was launching off. And instead of the natural thing to do, it would be go and get in the fire trucks and go and drive, take your tools and stuff over to the accident in case you need to extricate the guy. Everybody just started running and left all the fire trucks there. And uh, the instructor was like, what are you guys doing? Get back. Like, get the trucks and go. And that was, I always thought it was funny because everybody just, their instinct was just to run towards and help the guy, and help the guy instead of grabbing the trucks. Because obviously with not being in the fire service at that point, you, you don't think about that. But I always thought that was funny. It is funny. Anyway, we've had a fun, we had a fun time. But one thing we were for sure was freaking broke. Yeah broke like that full-time career bless their hearts they get underappreciated every day i don't think anybody understand that what 240 hours a month looks like what paying for benefits looks like what paying for your food not that you're looking for free food or free benefits but at the end of the day a firefighter net check is going to be around 750 to 800 dollars every two weeks for 120 hours 
So anyway, as we go down the pathway, we've had this really unique ride where we go in, we're all excited about fire. And then the reality after this training program, and then you have your EMT class, basic, you have your EMT advanced, you have mm -hmm. fire one, fire two, hazmat awareness, hazmat ops. What else? Wildland fire. Wildland. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you, uh, you'll, you'll go into pumper and you go into all the other stuff after an aerial, but initially just to get in the door. So you go through this and then this was in the 2007, 2006 time frame eight. I can't remember for the, right for the research and, uh, everybody was looking for work in government, right? Fire. So I applied at Salt Lake city fire at that time. And I think they had 3000 applications for Salt Lake County fire departments with like a half a dozen openings. It was yeah. almost non-existent. So mm -hmm. you push down the pathway of getting your, as many certs as possible. We went and got paramedic. I did and trying to help Curtis ended up getting hired at Riverdale fire full time before I did at Roy city fire. Yeah. I had to finish my paramedic class to get even an opportunity to try to get hired. There was always maybe one opening a year for a little bit of scene. Yeah. When you fight and you battle and you, you finally get to the point where you can go to work and then you get your paycheck. Yep. Talk about a deflating experience. You're like, I just gave 120 hours for $700. That is rough. That is rough. You know what I mean? Yep. There are a few places in the country and a few places even in the state of Utah where the firefighters do make uh, a livable wage where they don't have to work multiple jobs. But, you know, most people, most firefighters are, you know, they're working their fire job, which is 240 hours a month. And then in order to be able to do anything above and beyond what they're normally doing, they have to go work two, sometimes three jobs on top of that. So. Um, a lot of firefighters, they end up going and working uh, different de departments on the part-time schedule. So they'll go and work a few days or nights a month doing that. Um, and some start their own businesses. Did you have another part-time job? I didn't. I didn't. Uh, the reason why I didn't do it is because I, I saw so many of those firefighters that were working two, three jobs that were never home in the first place. And then I just didn't, you know, it, with the expectation that we were going to be doing this for, you know, 20 plus years, I didn't want to get burned out. Yeah, I made that doing mistake. Doing fire jobs. I did late and fire on top of it. So I had late yeah. fire, Roy fire, Morgan fire. Morgan was a volunteer, paid volunteer, EMT advanced service with the with the fire op. Yeah. I got burned out bad. Yeah. That was so it's hard. hard. It's what you would, you sleep it, you eat it, you drink it, and then you're still not making any money. So we were having to do construction projects on the side, whether it be concrete or tile or whatever. And then you're gone four or 500 hours a month just trying to pay bills. Yeah. Right. I think the hardest part too was, you know, you work, you know, we'll get into what we started doing together after, but you know, when you start working, um, and when you're gone so much, you, you don't realize the effect that it has on your family because you know, it became a huge realization for me when I would come home, you know, from fire or working another job after that. And I'd walk through the door and instead of my kid or my wife being excited that I came, they're like, oh, hey, look, dad's home. Like they just know that I'm never going to be there and that there's not a relationship there. And so that was a, that was always a hard for me to know that my family's at home by themselves. They're living their lives, doing things that they want to do basically without me. Um, and that was, that was, it made it easier as we kind of moved on in business to, to make that step to kind of step away from the fire side and uh, look at other business opportunities because I, uh, the best thing in the world is when you come home from a long day and your kid comes and runs to you and jumps into your arms. Not and, just the dog. Not just the dog. And uh, they're excited for you to be there. And, you know, they're actually sad when you have to leave. Whereas before it was, it was just the schedule. They, knew they didn't that, want to get attached because yep. they know you're not going to be there. Yep. I was, uh, I was, <coughs> I was ruining their, rotation in their schedule that they had because I was wanting to go and hang out and do things with them and it wasn't what they had already planned. So that, that was a hard, that was a hard thing to have to deal with. And, you know, that's a, what unfortunately a lot of firefighters have to do is they have to separate and they have to put off their family life to try and provide. And that's a, that's hard. Hmm. Yeah. So for us, when we started Murphy door, we, we were just trying to pay bills, right? So here we sit, trying to figure out what to do. We were doing CenturyLink on the side, selling some door-to-door -door sales for, you know, 
basically package deals, internet, cable, yeah. TV. That was a hard deal. Yeah. And then we'd run into a guy that had this, what was it called? The, uh, I can't remember, some bifold bookcase door thing. The amazing bifolding bookcase. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Anyway, we looked at it and we talked to him and he, he was representing that it was all his idea. And we'd found it that uh, even SpaceX doors that was before that on these bifolding door systems had built these doors before. But there was no real system on how to mass produce them. And all these were one-offs. Yeah. They had some basic hardware ideas that were okay, but not systematic really. More, con- and, more conceptual with the... Yeah. It had a good foundation and a good runway, but didn't really work. So what we did is we decided, hey, look, here's a good opportunity. Maybe uh, we could run this. Well, of course, we didn't even have two nickels to rub together. So we reached out to John Porter, who uh, owned Focus Services Group. And we kind of worked out a plan on what it would look like if he was to put an investment in. And we kind of went around the investment strategy a little bit different, right? So we, we said, hey, look, this is what this is going to look like. Um, we want to see if it even is going to work. So would you help us build a booth and pay for a trade show? And then we'll just try to operate some doors and see if that'll sell anything. And if there was interest. So our initial investment basically came in to see if the concept worked at a trade show. And I think we did the national hardware show or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think the initial investment was sub 20 grand. It might've been like, I think it was like 5,500 for the booth fee or 4,500 plus we spent a little bit on the booth and some rooms. Yeah. So it was sub 10 is the total first in was like 24. So what we did initially, just kind of the conceptual idea of how we were able to come up with the budget that we wanted to work with, or at least kind of forecasting a, a valuation to the business is we created an, an idea that this business, if, if it was to work would be a base value of around a hundred thousand if we wanted to push it through. So just so we had a starting point on what $24,000 would look like on an investment platform. So we took that 24,000 bucks, we broke it out on, you know, hey, this is 100, if you, as you put in this money, and again, I don't remember the stages to get to 24,000, you'll buy in a percentage of the business for every thousand, you get a point. So John's the most, or the least greedy person I've ever met. So he could really give two shits about how that equity came I think he just wanted to be responsible for us to be responsible with the money yeah so we broke this all down we put it into a stage category basically saying once we got to a hundred thousand and we invested this twenty four thousand then there was a new valuation to this project if it was to continue and in that twenty four thousand we had the initial patent research on our changes and then our branding and then design and some website deposit money as well as the first trade show and the display that we rented from that guy. Yeah. Right. Cause we weren't building doors at that point. <clears throat> it was just nope. only. We had a goal initially when we launched Murphy door, it was just to strictly do uh, hardware. We didn't want to, we weren't a cabinet company. We were just looking for something on the side to pay bills to help compensate our non compensation from a fire department. Yeah. Really is what it came down to. So we, we put 24 grand in, we broke it down and then the next steps were like a $250,000 valuation. And again, John didn't really care. He just wanted to see why, if you had a reason why you were increasing the value of the company. And we, we had reasons like, okay, now it's a, you know, patent applications in place. We've had some CAD drawings done. We have a brand that people are becoming more aware of. We have a website starting. <clears throat> and then uh, my wife's American Express. <laughs> really, that was how we, we funded most of this. Yeah. Right, because I I didn't have anything. I no good credit. My wife had a two thousand dollars Stratus after the first initial crash of construction. Um, anyway, it was awesome. We we got we got uh, really lucky on the progress and some lucky and hard work. The best part is, I mean, our office. Right. So if you're looking for an office space, here's an answer. You need to get creative. You need internet. Starbucks, three dollar cup of coffee, all day internet and free refills. So tell me how you beat that deal, yep. right? So we literally would have our meetings inside Starbucks. We'd go in there in the morning after fire, and it, the Starbucks was in Riverdale. Riverdale Road. Yep. Yeah, right off of uh, by his fire department and over the freeway from my fire department. We'd just meet there in the morning, and we'd spend all day, all day long. All day. Sitting there every day off that we weren't at the fire department. Non, and with some weekends, but mostly not weekends. And then eventually I was able to get my captain 
to his, her and her husband had started a, a, a small company doing something for the uh, oil rigs out in Vernal and North Dakota and South Dakota, mm-hmm. I think, or somewhere. And uh, they had a big warehouse, but we rented 400 square feet of space that we'd taped off 20 by 20 squares in. And we tried really hard to work within it, but we couldn't use the office space there. So we, we did the office at Starbucks and we did the warehouse there. And that office at Starbucks was what, two years, year and a half? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it would have been a little over a year for sure. Right. Not quite two years, but yeah, definitely over a year. So to give you an idea, the first year we did, uh, we started this business in December, 2012. And we started our business a little later than when we did our first sales in hardware. And we ended up doing in 2012 around 30 grand, if I recall. I kind of wrote some notes down, but I think it was around $30,000 in our first year of business, which was just hardware set. And it was a heck of a deal. I mean, now it's, a, it's almost as much as we made at the fire department, for heaven's sakes. Yep. So, yeah, we did 30000 bucks, right? It's crazy. Crazy. And then uh, next, we, we were getting a lot of people. We got Rockler. Rockler was our first big account yep. with hardware. We thought we just made Hit it. Hit the gold mine. So you guys have to envision this. We're driving down the road, taking customer service calls. I'm riding in a paramedic intercept or a fire truck, trying to place an order for a hardware set with sirens in the background, apologizing. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm really sorry, but we're going on a cardiac arrest. But if I can get your phone number and what you want, I'll call you back and get your order placed. Yep. There's a lot of that. A lot. For up until the middle of 2016, we did that for several years, you know, four or five years of orders, taking orders, pausing the order, calling back after a fire call, fire, customer service, installation questions. Hold on. I got a wild land (laughs) tracking. Yeah. Structure fire rollover and multiple calls while you're in the ambulance, fire truck or the red or on the the paramedic rescue. <laughs> and it was hard because like you didn't want to miss a sales call because everyone was so freaking important. Yeah. You're like, hold on just a second. I'm just extricating this person out of this car. Their head's pinched behind the steering wheel. Give me two minutes. I'll call you back. Yep. And luckily people, I don't know if it, they thought we were, I don't know if uh, maybe they didn't believe us. But, <laughs> uh, whenever I talk to somebody and say, Hey, you know what? I'm at the fire station. I'm on, on my way to a call right now. Do you mind if I call you back? I don't think I, I don't think I had anybody that was ever upset about us having to call them back, which is, which is good because that would have been uh, a little frustrating. But I think that helped getting out of the gate is we had the most amazing customers ever. Yeah, I mean most Murphy Door customers are amazing anyway. We have a couple trolls, but that's okay. We probably deserved that negative feedback anyway. But at the same time, and we've learned a lot from the negatives. But yeah. at the same time, our customers are, are amazing, especially the early on ones. They were understanding. We were clear. We were transparent. This is a side job to fire. We do fire and paramedics, and this is where our benefits come from, and this is our side job, and we're trying to launch really hard. Um, patience and and understanding. I don't know if we could have got a better roll of the dice with all those from our, patient, our customers. Especially with the new business, and we didn't really have – I mean, our website was pretty, j- pretty janky. And, uh, <laughs> janky. You know, we answering phone calls in a – with sirens in the background and you know, I, people were pretty trusting of dumping even at that time, just for hardware, you know, a couple hundred bucks for hardware. People are pretty trusting of us to make sure we delivered that. And yeah. And our doors started to what? Three grand. Yeah. I think our first doors were around three grand, five grand really fast. Cause when we finally, so this, this kind of got to the point where everybody was asking, they liked the hardware, didn't understand it, didn't want to build their own door. So they asked, Hey, can you build us a door? Well, we had no, understanding of how to build cabinets. I mean, we, we Curtis plumbed prior to fire. I did framing. I've done a bunch of other stuff, concrete, tile, roofing, whatever, but I'd never built a cabinet before. So, uh, my cross the street neighbor owns a cabinet manufacturing machine sales company or can you cabinet machine manufacturing sales company? So I reached out to him and said, Hey, you have anybody, you know, especially during this economic downturn that may be interested in building some doors on the side of their deal to help fill some space. So we found Merrill Cabinets yep. in Rigby, Idaho. Idaho. That was a heck of a deal. Yeah, that was a lot of work. Though, that was why we needed the square footage, right? Because they were bringing the doors in. Yeah, and, and then we, we were putting them together and packaging them up and shipping them out. Yeah, hinges and cardboard, put them in the box. So they'd build the carcass for us. We'd come in, screw our hinges on it, and then we'd put it in the box, address it, put it on a pallet, and ship it out. Initially, Merrill did it, but it was a lot for them, and then our freight was a little bit more money. And 
Um, mm-hmm. We were we were transporting back and forth with truck and trailer from Idaho back to Utah with those mm-hmm. carcasses that they had built. The second year, 2013, so get, kind of give you an idea, we went from 30,000 full-time fire paramedics doing hardware, and then about the middle of 2013, towards the end, we decided to start doing the cabinet deal. Mm-hmm. And we ended 2013 at around 90,000, 97,000. 97, we just shot just under 100 grand. So that was pretty good growth for us, especially as a part-time gig. And uh, of course, we didn't have a lot of overhead, Starbucks and $3 a day in internet. And then uh, I think they were charging us, what, 400 a month or 200 a month for rent? I can't remember. I can't remember what it was. It was enough. And they were really easy to work with. So that was fine. Outside if we got outside the blue line and Troy was on a kicker, right? He'd kick our shit back he in our He was just making square. sure we didn't lose our tools outside of the blue square. Yeah, that was nice. An empty warehouse, but he'd come in, get your shit in there. <laughs> Maybe he was kidding. I don't know. I'd like to think he was. But then we uh, we do pretty good. We end up getting... Oh yeah, I don't even remember. We had a lot of good luck. Yeah, we end up meeting this lady from Architectural Digest that says, hey, I like what you're doing, but you're doing it completely wrong. Only 1% of the world needs a hidden door, but the other 99% needs storage. This was at another trade show. And we uh, kind of reshifted our design ideas and said, hey, maybe we can create, or what she said something about, I like what you're building, but I like what you're doing in front of it, not what's behind the door. Like think of how to create storage solutions out of the door. We did. We took that really serious. And uh, in 2014, we did one point, just under 1.1 million, 1 million, 95,000. So to give you an idea of the growth pattern, 30 grand, 97 grand, 1.1 million, part-time job, right? And still trying to figure out which way's up, working on our website, working on pictures, working on designs. And by the way, half the stuff isn't real. You don't have to have it all real. No. Like we were borrowing pictures off Pinterest, probably mm-hmm. against the rules now, but at the same time, they weren't a real company. It was just somebody that made some cool stuff. And we th- thought the picture was cool and say, hey, this is a cool door. I think we could build that, you know? And then people would buy what we thought we could build before we ever even built the damn door. Yep. Right? Fake it till you make it. Yeah. But you know what? You know what I don't like is that saying. Fake it till you make it. Well, there's certain reasons that it matters. Like fake it till you make it matters. It's an important thing to say, especially like in that pretense. But where I don't like it when people go in after this fake it till you make it is like, well, I'm going to buy the Ferrari or I'm going to buy the Corvette and have people believe that I'm ultra successful. So that way they trust me. Yeah, I can see that. Right? And a lot of people do it. I had, I've had some really good friends like, I won't say his name. He was a framer, not a current framer. But he goes, he bought this really nice car and he had a really nice house. And uh, he just said, look, you got to fake it till you make it, man. People have to believe you're successful to trust you to give you the work. And I honestly completely disagree. People have to trust you to give you the work. They could give two shits if you're in a car. They could care less if you're living in a trailer. But if you're honest, they'll give you the work anyway. Yep. It's true. Just fake it till you make it business just is the standard Ponzi scheme game. Now, fake it till you make it under the pretense of using someone else's picture is fine. But I don't like when they spin it off in the direction that they have to lie about what they, their success rate's been. It's fair. Like, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. You see a lot of it. Yeah. But I, don't, I, I guess there's people out in the world that really do care about what car you drive. And maybe that adds some, you know, belief in their minds that, you know, if they can drive this car, then that must mean that they're busy and they're successful and that I can trust them. But I agree. I, I would care more about the final product than what it takes for them to drive to the job site to get there, you know. So I, I can see both sides. Look at what we went through just to get people to trust us. Here you have a three to $5,000 door on a website that barely works with a place that has no shop, an office in Starbucks. Obviously, most customers don't know it, right? And we never presented that we didn't have that. We were always forthright in being firefighters and everything else. Now, on the front, it may look like that you had a bigger operation than it was. I mean, but ultimately, we never defined the size. And all we did do really well was answer phone calls, customer service, and deliver what we said when we said. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really helped us get out of the ground, right? And then making sure we keep our commitments with the vendors, if we couldn't pay the bill. And believe me, there was a lot of days, Ken, you weren't here, when we'd have to reach out to the vendor and say, bad news, uh, we're not going to pay, we can't pay your bill Friday. And then, of course, they'd respond with, well, that's not going to work. 
we got to have, you got to pay on Friday. Well, I'm like, I'd love to say <laughs> that I'm going to, but ultimately I'm not because I don't no have the check there. to pay it. So you're going to have to wait till next Friday or the Friday after. And, and we have been so fortunate that every single one of our vendors, they trusted us. We've always paid them. And I try to do bad news in person since I met that me guy. Like if we weren't going to be able to pay a bill, either call them on the phone or go visit with them and just and tell them, hey man, look, I can't, it's not going to work. Well, we won't be able to ship you anything. Well, that'll be even stupider because then you won't be able to get anything else. But I promise you, I'm going to pay you this much on Friday. It's not going to be your whole bill, but it's going to be something. And then I'm going to do it. Still to this day, the majority of our vendors are the same vendors we've always had. Yeah, they are. And even still with with where we're at now, I even with these software companies and these tech companies that were using their software programs or, you know, to help us continue to grow, I still, in a conversation with them, bring that point up that we don't look at <clears throat> these potential customers or these partners that we're trying to work with. We don't look at them as just a, a resource. We're looking at them as a partner and we don't turn our partners and we, you know, are very reliable and we, you know, we look for the long-term relationship rather than just to get a means to an end. And so I think that helps also continue to build that trust and rela relationship with um, us and other vendors is because they, they know that I'm not just looking for a quick business and then move on. It's we're looking for people that we're going to, we can maintain long time relationships with. And that's a good thing with, with our vendors right now is they have a pretty safe space. They know we're not out hunting. And if we have a problem with it, we call, right? Well, we give them the opportunity before we go and look for somebody else to say, hey, this is where we're at now. This is where we need to be. And can you do can it? you can you grow into this spot? Or if not, then understand that we have to reach outside. And it's not like we're we're not being um, bully. We're not bullying them. We're trying to give them the opportunity to, to help them grow their business as well to to meet our needs. And if they can't, then we we're always up front with them and let them know that, you know, this is something we're gonna have to go outside for then. And I think having that clarity too also helps them, puts their minds at ease that they're not worried about us just kicking them out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's like our employees. We don't have a whole lot of attrition. We have some, but overall we, we look forward to that, to them growing and going yeah. to another place. Not that we look forward to leaving, but um, we really, we give them tuition reimbursement and some benefits, but the idea for tuition reimbursement is they don't have to do anything Doesn't inside the Murphy door envelope. Yeah. Yep. They can go do medical or pharmaceutical or whatever. We've had the last few people do, but it's awesome. Like it's super hard. You kind of create your your exit of the, some of your very best employees because the ones that work hard are the ones that are going to school and are the ones that are motivated. And those are the ones that are exiting because they've now, well, not all, but they, they are now educated in something they really yeah. have a passion for. Mm -hmm. And so even though we're excited to see them move on, it's really hard for us as a company to see them move on, right? Because I mean, selfishly, they were the great ones, but. Yeah. Takes a lot of experience with them when they leave and it's hard to replace that. And you know, I think, I think something important too is, you know, we've kind of gone through year one, two, and kind of working on three, but, you know, we did so have good growth. Year from, three, yeah, two million. Yeah. So we've had good growth from double again, one to year three, but it still didn't make us any money, right? No, we none didn't of, have none any of us took profit. any paycheck. We didn't, it's not like, oh, we get a million dollars. Now we can just live fat. It wasn't because one thing that uh, we've, always done is just always invested the money back into the business to continue that growth. Uh, and, and when you grow that fast, you have to have infrastructure and you have to, when you change a direction, you have to have things in place and that stuff always costs money. So you're just going into year three, move, new game yeah. hall, mm -hmm. building right by, so here's a great location, right between the liquor store and the homeless shelter. Yep. That was wonderful. Yeah. So guess who's hangs out with us? Well, we had some good workers for day mm -hmm. labor anyway. But nonetheless, so we move into 8,000 square feet. We walked into there and it was like, this is huge. <laughs> we, we will never, ever, ever fill this up. Look how huge this thing is. I remember showing up in a fire truck and we're going in here and I thought, man, they had boats parked in there yeah. and stuff. We're like, this is going to last us forever. If we ever have enough to fill this up, we're That'd going to be, be rich. Yep. <laughs> well, two weeks later. Yeah. Right. So we started, you know, Merrill started getting busy. This is when it's starting to be, what, 2014, 2015. Painting, we started getting full carcasses. We'd start delivering big pallets of pre-stock inventory. Yep. Had to go up and rack it up. We've had, so Curtis, by the way, I, he's the vice president of Murphy Door, and he's been running day-to-day -day operations for Murphy Door for a couple of years now. So he's the uh, he's the one that's handling all the drama and the growth on 
on most of that on a day-to-day level. And uh, I try to work towards the growth side, forward, forward-looking, and, and Curtis works on the day-to-day operations. And what a freaking hard deal. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it's fun because, it you know, sometimes you don't realize how much work goes into jumping from 97000 to a million dollars in growth. I mean, and, and then, one to two and, and two to five to two and, and five to 10. <laughs> 10 to it's, uh, it seems like, right. well, you just add more machines or you just hire more people, but it, it's, it's more than that. And there are systems and processes and software and, and machines. Yes. And people, yes. And, but that it takes a, it, it's a lot of work to get something moving in the right direction when you're growing so fast that you think that you've got something built out for what you need. And then sales just continue to jump faster and faster. And what you thought you needed at that time is far, far short, far short of what we need. We talked about this yesterday a little bit, but you know, there's, there's a few elements in that growth piece that you really have to do. And these are the hardest pieces to learn. Um, one, I think the most important thing is trust. And it's really hard. You know, we, we tell ourselves this, and I think it's like that nonverbal programming that it's, you have to earn my trust. Well, that's a really, really bad growth retarder. Like it slows your growth immensely. If you're using any kind of preface of conversation or an employment opportunity for anyone like Ken or anyone when they come in, like you have to earn my trust. And as you slowly earn my trust and you prove to me that you're trustworthy, then I can go ahead and give you more power or more tools to be successful. Well, where are you going to go? Well, the first off, you're going to have a very mad employee because you don't trust him out the gate. They can't show what they really can do because you don't trust them out the gate. And then you aren't growing to get to the point where you can trust them with more horsepower because they don't have any wings to fly with. Right. So the hardest thing for us to learn for me initially was, okay, I got to trust wholeheartedly and the, and bless Von Dreheim's heart. You know, he was an old captain at Roy. His son was my partner and then became my deputy fire chief, but he made it. So we really had to grow a business, right? Yep. So Vaughn was our first uh, manager, manager of Murphy Door. Well, he really managed the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like mm-hmm. he was probably our general manager um, right out the gate. And then immediately when Vaughn came in, we had to onboard Kentucky because if we didn't, we'd be broke, right? Yep. We um, Shipping costs. and we'll go, we'll go into that too, how that went on really fast. But uh, we had to t- trust Vaughn. And so every single credit, and if you guys can imagine, you have $800 in, in a paycheck. Well, somebody cancels their door and we've we've invested in it. We bought the wood. We had Merrill's build it. We went to Rigby and picked it up and we've got it all boxed. Someone calls and says, never mind. Well, first off, it's a custom box. Like, you know, our return policy is pretty hard and, it, and it's hard for people to swallow. But if they look at it like it's a kitchen cabinet, they've given us the measurements, the wood type, the color, the knobs, the swing, the hinge, the lock placement, the styles. I mean, there's 32 million options at a Murphy door. And then when they want to cancel, they think we'll just put it back on the shelf. I'm like, we have one in 32 million chances of selling this. So most likely if they cancel, then we have to throw it away. Yep. And it's a sad deal. But at the same time, Vaughn, you know, he was taking the phone calls and he listened to the stories and people have legitimate reasons on what would happen. Someone passed away or whatever else. And then all of a sudden he's saying, Hey man, you got to give me some horsepower. So I don't have to call you when you're on a call to see if we can give this guy a credit of even a hundred dollar discount because we have a scratch. Well, that was a hard trust step for me. Well, eventually he got up 100, 200, 500 to 2,000, I think, or $3,000, which keep in mind is more than I make in a month. So you have to really trust. But what, what that enabled us to do, because even for you and me both, I guess would be that we were able to grow a business instead of a job, that we didn't have to be involved in every single decision every day. We enabled Vaughn and we empowered Vaughn to make decisions and help us grow so we could operate on a five day a week business rather than just every other day like the fire department ran. So the trust her, uh, trust is tough, but it's the most important step initially to business first off. And, and you can trust carefully, like you don't have to trust blindly. I try hard to trust blindly. I find myself shortcoming on a lot of different things. But at the same time, my goal in my heart is to trust blindly as possible. But we, we work on it. So then you have your trust piece. And then what was the next thing? The next thing you really have to do is you have to learn how to leverage people and not in a negative sense. Like you don't want them to feel like they're the leverage, but there's a lot of people that have a skill set that you have nowhere near that skill set. And hopefully you don't think you do because that's that's also handicapping to your growth, right? Sure. It, it really brings down the speed of your growth capacity if you feel like you have to be involved in every single step of a product. And especially out the gate when the product's your baby, this business is your baby. We felt like, okay, well, let me look at it. Is that good enough to send out? 
Well, as you grow, there's no way you should be able to touch every product in every phase and then package it and look at it, inspect it. Every step, there's just a velocity that passes your ability, especially when you're trying to keep another job out. So you can't trust. And if you can't trust, you can't leverage, right? Leveraging being leveraging people's skill sets, their knowledge, their abilities, and empower them to do whatever it is that they can. And then the next one is setting reasonable expectations, right? You got to set expectations that people can hit and hold them accountable for it. And that's something I've really sucked at. And we've talked about this over the last little bit, especially when the growth outpaces your, well, the growth has outpaced my level of ability to set expectations in a proper time frame and hold people accountable for it. As I've seen over and over, especially this last 18 months, where we've seen a 300% growth spike, right? Yeah. That's really hard to keep up with the demand as you as you double your manufacturing capacity and then a third machine. I mean, you just triple and really tough. And then you don't even have the opportunity to keep up with what is that expectation and how do you hold that guy ex- accountable when they've never even had that guy? Like, like Ken's role over here, right? We've never had this role of helping us get our video catalogs. I mean, the, the role that Ken plays for us is an imperative role. And here we are, you know, six years, seven years down the pathway. Well, we're having him put together video catalogs and instructional catalogs and, and warranty and new advertisements and stuff that we could really showcase proper. But we haven't even had the time or the energy or the ability to find the guy like Ken that can help us really do it. Do it. Yeah. So here we are, you know, the last three years, I mean, I guess two years, and this one we did get qualified, we know where we sit, but is the, you know, USA Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies. Not that it matters, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool to think that we've been able to maintain this pace still by playing, you know, hindsight and fixing backwards. And I think if I had, if I was really good at my job, which I'm not, I would be able to see some of this. And I think that as we grow, a lot of these things like sheet gets pulled back and you're able to see more and more of what it takes to do what we do. And then you're able to see, you know, hindsight's 2020, all the things that we could have done better that would have really exacerbated our growth even further. Yeah. So back in, we, in 2000, let's see, this is our sixth year in Kentucky. So early on in our business, we had this freight agreement, by the way, with UPS Freight. And, and uh, UPS Freight had spent quite a while trying to give us a price on a pallet to ship it around the nation. And they came in, and I'll never forget the numbers. It was 192 bucks to ship our pallet anywhere in the country, right? Which was great. So we were working out of Newgate Mall. We had this agreement with Costco initially that was doing some special order purchases and a couple of our standard doors. We had about a few hundred doors that we were shipping. And then this UPS stepped in with $192 fixed cost. Well, they'd bid it out. They'd had their freight investigators. They'd helped us, their inspectors and their freight people kind of all put together what they wanted in packaging. And then we shipped the first, you know, several doors with them. And then we got a back charge of what, 60 grand. Because they said we'd misclaimed the door as a door instead of a bookcase or vice versa. Wrong class. Yep. Wrong class code. So we still had several doors to ship to the tune of about 80 grand. And we had no money. Not only did we not have the 60000 to pay that bill, we had like... You know, it was like 6,000 versus 60,000. They'd done an eight or 10 times deal because they'd find us, right? And then they yep. tripled the class code. They went from like a class 80 to a class 300, yep. FAK or whatever that was. Not FAK, but a freight class. Yeah. Who knows? Well, immediately we were talking to Old Dominion and Tommy, and he said, hey, man, I would look at Kentucky or something like that where you're in the East Coast where it'll help you get your freight down into a normal place. So, it was like that week I flew out to Kentucky with no idea of what I was looking for. We'd looked at a map and said, he said East Coast. And I, we looked at a map and we're like, what's almost like Salt Lake City on the other side? Yeah, we kind of followed after what UPS did with their world port because their world port is in Kentucky. And it uh, it's in Cincinnati, because, right? Or somewhere. Uh, or is it Kentucky? I Louisville. Think in, I think it's in Kentucky, but maybe. FedEx. Not, but it was one of, uh, them. one of them. But the reason why they put there was because of their proximity to everywhere else in the country. 50% of the U.S. population within yeah. 600 radius miles of Lexington, Kentucky. That's pretty amazing. So we went over there and then we run into no one is <laughs> giving us a lease. We're like, hey, well, I make 760 bucks every two weeks at the fire department and I have this new brand new door company and here's the asset holders like GE and all these companies that have the lease agreements and the two days I spent there were all downer. And then I ran into uh, John Paul Miller 
who took a chance on us and gave us a really nice office space and worked up the lease agreement. And we became good friends after that in Lexington. And he owned a local car dealership, owned a lot of the real estate in the industrial park, took us to the horse races, introduced us to the governor. And we had some quick gains of relationships yeah. in Kentucky. So this ride's been super fortunate. We've been super, super, it's been super fun and lucky. But ultimately, you know, the idea of this out the gate conversation I wanted to kind of cover was like, hey, we kind of in, in, retrospect looking backwards it's been a really fun ride but it has been fucking grueling man it has it has been hardcore yeah. right so when people think you know you're going to be doing uh I, I can't wait to start a business and be rich right that that's one of those things that is just an oxymoron they just don't work there was a time in 2016 right before i quit roy and just like you said you know it, it's funny when you said the story before it reminds me of my story when I got home and we'd been going to Kentucky and I was on the rescue and I was working part-time at Leighton Fire. So my wife, I walk in the door and my wife had her earbuds in and she was mopping. My little girl was on an iPad. That I tried to use iPad a few times and I just don't like them. So anyway, she had one of my iPads and then no one said it even hi. I'd been gone, I think I was on like six days or eight days gone, ready to go back to duty the next day. And not one person even acknowledged my existence. They'd walked by me in the kitchen and, and you walk in from the garage into my kitchen and no one even looked at me. Except for here comes Ruger with his tail wagon. He's like, oh, hey, man. Like, so finally I looked at my wife and I'm like, so not even one freaking person is going to say hi to me except the dog. And she said, well, if you want someone to be around and acknowledge you here, you might want to be here a little bit. These girls don't even know who you are. Like you visit, you know, twice a month. Like, if you want to hang out and just have a place to sleep for in between your travels, that's fine. But if you want to be a dad, then be one. Yep. Right. Which was a really hard lesson. And, you know, I have a, I've had a, I had a really serious conversation with my fire chief and him and I just didn't get along. There was one conversation that I've told a lot of people where he sat down and he said, Hey, these are your worlds. Right. And he used this giant rock on the, uh, this was on the apron at the fire station. And he said, Hey, this is your world. This is you, your family. This is everything. Um, that's about you. This is the most important thing in the center of your universe. And then he got a middle rock, middle sized rock, and he put it away. And he said, this is Murphy door. And this is you, your, all your employees that are there that are reliant on you. And this is roughly 2016. So we were doing around 4 million ish. Right. <clears throat> and I had this goal of leaving the fire department at 5 million. That was kind of my my deal. And he said, well, and then you have Murphy door and about all these families that are relying on you and the vendors that are relying on you. And then you have Roy fire. And it's this little teeny rock sitting over here on the outside of this universe of mine. And he goes, and right now Roy fire de decides everything that happens in these other two universes. So you have the smallest, least important piece as the center of your universe. And as long as the biggest rocks on the outside of your universe, that's going to be flung off and the whole thing will fall apart. There's just no way to keep together a universe with the smallest weight in the middle. So that kind of rang home. I mean, if, if there was anything of value that he said, that was for sure it. And uh, I ended up quitting full-time June. My last day was June 16th, 2016. And uh, anyway, that was, that was kind of the push. But just like you said, your girls, they, eh, huh? Yep. What do you want to do? And, and my wife, had, she'd got her little book out and she'd been keeping, she had a little blue book like this. It was a calendar thing. And she goes, you've been gone 540 hours this month. So here's the hours you were home. Here's the hours you were awake that you were home. So basically the kids and I had about six hours of your wake, awake time over the last month. And it's been this way for a year. Um, I'm not doing this. This isn't how I'm going to have my marriage. This isn't how I'm going to have my family. This is not what I'm looking for. It's not why I did it. So you need to decide. And that was, uh, that was an eye opener. But it hasn't really changed. So thank goodness I've had a forgiving wife. She said, you got to be done at five and you got to be home. And then finally, as I was going home at five, after I'd gotten to Murphy door, you know, I quit fire while I was giving all the time back to Murphy door anyway. So she's like, hey, you left fire for a reason. So you could be a dad. But now all your hours are going to Murphy door anyway. Right. And then I went part time to Weaver Fire District. And she said, <laughs> um, well, why don't you just get home at five? Like I want you home by 530. You have to leave work by five o'clock. So I did that, and then that lasted about six months. And then she, 
usually when I'd stay till seven or eight or nine or 10 or whatever, when I got home, I was done, right? I didn't talk to anyone anymore. Well, when at five, I wasn't done. So I'd get home and I'd spend all my time on the phone. And finally, she's like, bless her heart. You know what? If you're just going to come home and stay on the phone, you're in a bad mood when you get here anyway, because you're not done with all the calls. Why don't you just stay work until you're done? Because I like it better. At least when you get home, you're not talking on Distracted. the Distracted. So, but the, the life balance, man. It's hard. Especially because, you, like you said, you have you have a business that's flourishing and that you have a at this point, you know, 10 people in the company that are relying on us to keep the business moving and 10 keep, people. Oh, is this in 2016? In 2016, probably. Yeah, maybe. Uh, there's a little more because you had probably Kentucky. That's right. You had Kentucky at that time. You probably had around 20 people. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to, it's priorities. And, you know, when I, I think I quit January of 2016. Yeah, Curtis had bigger balls than me, Ken. Yeah. Like he quit fire. Eight months, six months before I did. So he believed in Murphy Door way before I did. Yep. So Well, I kind of came down to that same thing, the same realization that I have to decide what I'm going to do is, am I just going to be a, a person that comes and every once in a while my kid sees me and my wife sees me and we spend a little bit of time and, and you know, we just keep this going on forever or do we, you know, take a chance and hope for something that's going to be better and uh, take a chance on a business that's growing fast and is working well and, um, you know, may give me more time to spend with not being a stranger in my own house. So, yeah, it, you know, it, it, once I weighed out the options of, you know, we're looking at this fire business as a 20 year retirement and then, you know, I'd be retired at, you know, 48 years old from a fire. You know, I, that's wait, wait, wait. I'm almost 48. See, I would been almost done. But are you saying you'd be almost dead at this age or what? I'd be almost retired at oh, 48. Yeah, retired. Okay. But then I, at 48 years old, that's too young to really retire. So I'd have to go work another 20, 30 years anyways. And so by the time you retire with a fire pension and, you know, 50% of your three highest years, you know, I'm. You have 70 bucks. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. So. It's really what pushes you into the Murphy door world. And as a, as a company for, for us, we've looked at it and said, let's bring the benefits that are just like, so like, sir, you know, government services vacation, sick leave, health care, vision, dental, retirement. Um, try to bring those options in, yep. tuition reimbursement, all the things that led us to come over here or led us to public service, I should say. Yeah. You know? Took us some time to get to the same benefits, but we don't have city funding behind us, you know? So it, we had to build up to it as we could and offer more vacation as we could and more sick leave as we could and more benefits as we could, but I think we're continually making the right progress in the right direction. And I, you know, we're what we offer for the employees and what we're, how we respect them and, and treat them. I think it is the reason why we have such long tenure for people that are staying here. They feel like they're appreciated and they feel like they're part of the growth because they are. Yeah. And we share. Yeah. Like our, we, as Murphy door, so you guys know, we give 10% of our net profits back to our employees and it's split, even, or it's split evenly amongst all the employees inside every department. It doesn't matter if you're a lead or uh, it doesn't matter. Everybody's just as important. I think every position and, you know, putting a lot of thought into the way I look at our employees is everyone is the leader of their own job. So whether you want to call them their CEO, but to me, the better and the more ownership, excuse me, the more ownership someone takes into a role, the uh better of an employee they are. And I don't care if they're just packaging hardware, or they're packaging a door, or they're shipping product or their assembler. If they treat it as if they own that project or they own that business of that task, um, it only helps Murphy door grow. So the way I've been trying to set it up and probably not been super clear is if we go through the 10% profit sharing piece is it's just as if you own part of the door company, right? And the better you run your business or your operation or your task, referring to it as a business, the better the net profits will be. Yep. Your contribution margin lifts everyone. Your non-contribution margin drops everyone. Drops everyone. So back to the trust and empowering and leveraging others and you know, holding expectations and then holding them accountable for those expectations. And then the next step after that scale. You can't 
all those things and probably several other things in between those lines have to occur prior to scale. But you definitely have to have those four boxes checked first. If you can't, scale can't happen. It may happen to a small degree, but there's no way to maintain this scale. I mean, these type of growth, this type of percentage, these types, it takes relationships. And I'm proud to say right now, we've really, we had one initial investor of, you know, John Porter, and then we got a line of credit through Decathlon Capital has been great. Um, that's almost paid off. We're, we're just uh, October, be all gone. All our first round of equipment's all paid off. A lot of our stuff, right? Just a new round that we just bought this summer or this last spring yep. is new. But ultimately, we've been diligent in looking at how do we do it and and uh, from a lot of past lessons and, and and everything. But the right people is is truly a key. And I think we get sometimes passive on people, not just us, but in general as a population. I think everybody is a right person at some aspect. It may be the wrong time in their life to be the right person, but I think we give everybody the best opportunity we can. We should shoot to give them the best opportunity we can for that role and be as patient as we can to work through people's problems. We're all going to have one. I mean, if we're telling each other that we're going to never have an issue where we're sick or we're getting divorced or we have a death in our family that we don't know how to handle, we, you can't be so system or systematic that when people have problems, whether it be drug or alcohol, whether it be that, right? How things happen to people, we can't just exit. And I think we've done really good about helping and working with people that have got and had struggles. I mean, there's a point where you have to make a decision, but it shouldn't be the first time or the, you know, the first week when things bad happen. And I believe as a company, most of us lift where we stand. And I think they generally know, especially with our other, every other Friday we do our lunches, right? I think they realize that our true hearts sit with them. That if there is struggles, you don't hear the negative feedback that I thought we would feed, we'd hear if like, hey, you know, Curtis has had some drinking problems and he's in rehab for the next month and we're gonna pay for that. And not only that, but we're gonna try to help wherever we can with his sick leave or vacation and whoever wants to contribute to that. I haven't had really any negative pushback of you. Have, no. I mean, has anybody come up to you and said, hey, I don't like the idea that Curtis is going through rehab and and he's getting vacation and sick leave and we're contributing to it. And then we're also paying for that. And it's coming out of our margin. Like generally speaking, when those things happen, I bring it up to the whole company and say, hey, Billy Bob's having a problem. Are we willing to are you guys OK if we help pay for this? Because it is going to affect our net margin, no. which then affects bonus. Right. And I don't think we've ever had a no vote, right? When we've had line of duty deaths we contribute to or no. whatever other assistance. I think, uh, you know, on a business side of things, kind of going off this same tangent that we're on, I can see why corporate America does the th things they do where there is, it's black and white. There's no gray area. There's no, well, let's look into the situation and see if there's something we can do to help. It's just yes or no. Like it's, well, no, it's easy. There, it's easy. Ultimately, it's easy, it's easy because then you don't have to you don't have to put any effort or thought into it. You just the policy and procedures in place that if you miss this, you're gone. So sorry, thanks for your time, but you're out. That that is an easier well, and it's way a profit driven. It's a profit driven yeah. model, but I think it's short sighted. It's very. I think of you know me personally and you and all of us. We're doing everything we can to avoid that corporate structure and lifestyle. You know, obviously we're growing and we're getting bigger and we have to be a little bit more careful because, you know, we are exposures out there. Yeah. Well, and we're, we're not a small boys club like we were when we first started. It was and just a national and brand. And yeah, yeah. We're everybody. Know. Yeah. Now we're, I guess. we have to be a little bit more careful, but we're still treating this as if we're a small business and we still have the relationships and the friendships. And, you know, I go out of my way to try and help and understand what people are going through and not because it's. I want to get into their personal lives, but because I want them to know that they're valued and that their their life matters. And it's not just that they're a number that we just check off and say, oh, we, the, he was late two days, he's gone because that's our policy. We we look into situations and we, we dive more into the person than maybe we probably should. But I think that goes back to that family lifestyle that we're trying to create where we took from the fire world, where our world was 
these firefighters we spent 24 or 48 hours with at a time and we create such good friendships and relationships that that's who we hang out with on our days off or when we have time it's it just blends into our our personal lives as well and i think we've done really well in in that aspect of bringing that same friendship and the relationships that we have here at murphy door because even after our stuff, we're still going and hanging out with so each other. what do you think about when people say, oh, you should never be friends with your employees? Uh, I mean, that's stupid. What do you think when people say you should never hire your employees or your friends? Um, or that family? One, I think, well, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. I mean, I get that there are some nepotism things, and I think it could be used against you in a way, but uh, you're, you want to bring in people that you trust and that you know and – uh, if it's family, great. As long as there's an understanding that you have to separate business from family and you have to separate business from just friendly relationships. Well, we have family here sure. and how have we structured it. Well, I mean, we just had one that just got hired in just a few months ago that, um, is a cousin, but nobody knew that. And it was never used for them to get the position. It was, we put the application stuff out and they put in and they were interviewed. It was a completely blind situation that nobody was told that, hey, this is a cousin of so-and-so, but they got the, the person, job, they got they the job because there. they were qualified. It the interview or it wasn't that. To, yeah. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing in family and friends to work as long as there's that understanding that they're not going to be protected or not going to be treated in any way differently than every other employee is. I wouldn't say not protected because I think we protect all our employees. But what I would say about the family and friends deal is, is people say you shouldn't handle family and friends or hire. And I, I would agree for a long time. Like I was like, yeah, no, I would never hire friends and family. That's terrible because they'll always be the first to fuck you. Well, it's not really fair. I don't think it's the, the first ones to do that. I think they're actually the last ones to do that or the first ones to accuse it. So I think if we bypass friends or family, we're missing out on great opportunities. We just have to hire the right friends or family, right? Right. We have to look at it and say, hey, look, they're a great friend. Not only are they a great friend, but they're a hard worker. Like it depends on how you're disseminating between which friend you're hiring, right? There's some great friends that I would never want to work with, right? Even yeah. at the fire department, you're like, holy crap, he's lazy, but man, is he a freaking great time to be with. Yeah. We, we went on him here, but I'd like to go freaking down the river with him. Right. Right. And then same with family members. You have some family members. I've even tried to hire in some places already dead now, but just to work with him on the side, but man, that was rough. You know, when we knew it before we hired him, Yeah, we just were hoping for better. And sometimes one of the things I've learned is you already know of whether it be friends or family or business decisions or customers or marketing campaigns. And we're generally talked into things that we don't want to do. The answer is you already know, you already know the answer. So why are you fighting it? And people will respond and say, I'm cold, like uh, you hear it all the time, and I'm mean, or I can be. I'm just blunt. Like, I just don't want to learn the lesson I already know anymore. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've already learned it a lot. Yeah, you've already done Like, it. you want to do it? No. No, I don't. Well, you're a dick. Yeah. I'm not trying to be one. I just don't need to learn the lesson I'm already know. But I'm going to be different. No, I know. Not here. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I shouldn't say not here, but I don't want to do vendorship or customer base or nothing. But, you know... That's probably the hardest part about growing is everybody stands on the outside and they think, oh man, you're doing this or you have all this money. And, you know, we do turn a lot of money, right? And we do do a lot of business. But at the same time, I, the wonderful thing about what I believe Murphy Door is, is none of it matters as far as the dollar take home side. We all have a common goal. And I think when you find a mission that's really the, to lift all tides, like to raise all people inside our world of Murphy door, whether it be our customers or our vendors or our employees, like actually completely reversed. And I know that's probably broken, but employees and vendors and customers, because I think the customers at the end of the tide of happy employees and happy vendors will result in happy customers. Yeah. So you see these, you know, kind of customer facing businesses that'll say customers always ride, which is generally true. And well, let me say most, most of the time true, not generally true, but um, make the customers first. No, I don't think that's right. Because if you make customers first, then employees feel second, and then vendors feel third, and then 
employees aren't going to deliver their best. And it's, it's hard to ask employees or vendors to go above and beyond if they're second or third. Yep. And that if their word is always discredited to first, which is a customer we don't know or have to work with very often, right? We want to work with them as much as we can. So we've kind of taken a unique spin at it. We said, look, our employees are first, our vendors are second, and customers are third. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way to customers, but what the goal would be is we set our employees first and we raise their waters and we bring them into good spirits and we make it so they can afford what they can afford and they can have a house and a car, feed their families and buy kids shoes and put them in dance and play soccer and, and achieve the goals that they want and help pay for their college, right? So they can't ever say they haven't had the opportunity to go to school. They have one right now, yep. right? That they can go to. So if we get them in a position that's ultra comfortable and they're happy and they're, it's easier on their family life, their marriage, their kids' lives, they're not the ones without the you know soles on their shoes, hopefully, mm-hmm. right? And then the same for our vendors. If we're on time, we're going to get the product. We can be more demanding on time constraints. We've had a huge, extreme tough material shortage, right? Around the nation, hardwoods, MDF, particle board, whatever. Have we felt one nickel of it? Little, right? Very little. Our prices have not come anywhere near the 300% price increases. 15, maybe. Well, that's a good thing because, I mean, our goal is never to keep raising prices on products. Our goal, and like I said, when we first started, you know, our standard base door price. was $3,000 and that was just for a basic door. Yeah. And now a $3,000 door is a pretty... About well, 800 bucks. Stacked out, yeah. well built door. So that we, same door is 800 now. Yeah. Right. So, what I was getting at is because we treat our vendors and we pay them fast and we, we do what we say and we don't back charge, I think that's why we haven't felt the shortage. We've never gone one day without having material here. Yeah. Never. Whether it comes from, from Oregon or Montana or wherever it's coming out of, and even all the way to Kentucky, we still haven't been short enough to not work a day. And we haven't had huge price increases. I think our, our materials up a little bit over the last little bit, like 7%. It's not nowhere near what lumber is for everyone else. And I and we have the right, well, I shouldn't say have the right, but because of the relations we have, we've been able to ask the hard questions. Like, no, I can't let you go that high. Like, we have to go lower. You can't do this. It's really hard for us to raise prices for one, but that's not our goal. And I think if we were one of those customers that took advantage of the vendor's relationships, we wouldn't be able to ask what we ask. We wouldn't be the first ones to have material. Like we're always the six o'clock delivery. Always. Mm-hmm. It helps that we're the largest consumer MBF around here. But at the same time, um, I think that customer or employee first, vendor second, customer third approach. Ultimately, it is putting the customer first, but going at it in a different form. Right. Right. They are the most important part of our triangle, but we have to do it this way, kind of. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I, yeah. I think I, I'm now I'm just confused myself, but I kind of think that, that that's what it is. Ken, you're a good bystander. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I actually kind of agree. When I was working on film sets and stuff, um, you know, I, I knew a lot of producers and directors that would be all smiles and real cool with the clients or the agencies or whatever. And then they'd turn around and just be, you know, sometimes they're just short and, not a lot of interaction with the crew. Sometimes they're just downright mean. And uh, I, what I took from that was just, it, I worked less for those people. And then the client got a worse product. And, I, and that's not because I want to do bad work. It's just because you're not motivated. you know. So on my sets, if I'm in charge, I always make sure my crew is, they come first. Yeah. They are happy. They're comfortable because if they work well, the product's good. That's exactly what we've experienced here. Yep. And, you know, you, as you, as you're a young company, it's easy to start following everybody else's um, methodologies of running their business. Like, oh, customers first, and we got to do whatever it is to make the customer happy. And yes, those are all right answers. But is the customer really first? Will you have customers if you have not put your employees first? If you have not put your vendors up front? You can't even get to the customer piece. Yep. So is the customer right? Generally speaking, yes. Do, is there some dishonest ones? Yeah, there's some real fucking dickheads out there that just troll. They're out there to be mean. Like even some of our reviews, 
They don't even buy a freaking door, right? Or the one star that we got a freaking pallet that was bad. Like we touched a pallet. We give them a good pallet. Of course, it goes across, I don't know how many, nine docks. Mm -hmm. And the way they write their review says, well, the door, lucky that we had people there would have just fallen apart. Well, they weren't even talking about the door. And you keep reading down the review. It's like, oh, the door was fine. But look at this piece of junk pallet they shipped. Well, I can assure you, Murphy Door did not send you anything but a great brand new pallet when it left the office. But it goes across nine semis. But, you know, the customers can be very, very ferocious. And when you think about business, it's super discouraging. Like even now when I get a one-star review, what happens to everybody's phones and emails at night? Blows up. Sunday at two in the morning. I promise you to our customers, we're reading it. We care about it. Um, if they're valuable, don't just do a one star and not say anything. Help us grow. And uh, we want to make it right. And it doesn't help on a one star review if you just put CL. Like, let's know who it is. Like, let's, let us understand it. Give us a chance to make it right. Yep. And I truly believe most businesses, not all, but most businesses have the same desire. I think, uh, you know, kind of going back to the growth side of stuff, it's the hard part. Um, like I say, you, you, we talk about employees and even vendors and other companies people are working with, but the hardest, the hardest thing with such rapid growth ultimately is change. Change, change is oh, extremely yeah. difficult. Our guys hate it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, <laughs> when you, you come up with a new, uh, a new machine that we need to have, that's going to speed up the process. It's going to then change the entire flow of where the shop's going. Are you talking about my new drill? Yeah. Your new drill. <laughs> Outside right now that yeah. everybody's bitching about. Yeah. yeah. But I heard today he's like, well, it's actually going to be faster than now. We probably won't need that. And I said, Hey man, we're not even going to have that conversation. Yeah. That is not where we're headed. He's like, well, I just don't think I'm like, well, don't, we're just asking you just let's give it a whirl yeah. first, but let's not just disqualify yeah. it. And that's a, uh, it's hard because you, you grow, um, your machines, you grow your processes, you grow your softwares, you grow your teams, you grow your people. And <clears throat> when you grow so fast, it's hard to, because what you've worked on for months to get a new process and flow changed, by the time changed. it gets implemented, it's, it's already a new process. What about our conveyors? Remember when they were a bad idea? Yep. <laughs> Nobody wanted to do the conveyors. Yeah. That was funny. They were right. like, hey, now this is stupid. That's not going to work. What do you think about that? Ken, they, they said that the conveyors to move the doors was a bad idea. They were picking up and hand moving them all. Yeah, I think it's pretty genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're like this. I don't know why you're doing it. This is stupid. That's never going to work. I'm like, okay, well, just let us give it a try. We're going to just see if these doors will be easier if they move in flow down switches and conveyors. And then you're not picking up 200 pound doors at a time. I mean, let's just give it a try. Because I mean, ultimately, you're going to have to pick up 60, 80, 100 doors a day. It'll save you several thousand pounds worth of lifting today. Yeah. Let's just give it a spin. Well, guess what? After about three days in, they're like, oh, man, I don't know. I would never go back to the vendor or to non-conveyors. No yeah. But the, I think every, the painter was a bad idea. It yeah. sat out in the shop for like, in the barn, for like two, three weeks. Nobody was excited about putting that thing in. Well, I everybody thought it was, everybody. And then the sander. And, and maybe we didn't do a very good job of explaining to the team the reason yeah. why we're bringing that in, I think everybody thinks that when you bring in a new piece of machinery, it's to replace our employees and that we wouldn't need the painters to be spraying the doors anymore because we've got this cool new machine that you put the pieces through and it reads it and it automatically sprays where it's supposed to be and comes out the perfect finish every time. You know, their thought process is, oh, I'm not going to set that you're machine up because me. you're trying to get rid of me. So I'm going to delay this yeah. out as long as it can. And that's never the intention I mean, we haven't lost anybody no. to invest. We've, added, kind of added, we've had to add more people, if anything, because our output, our output's gotten faster and uh, we've become way more efficient. So we need more people to be able to offload and, and to feed the, the machines. So. so to give you an idea, just in 2000, I'm not on the page anymore, but in 2016, a great day was six doors, eight doors, right? Yeah. A great day. I mean, we were just celebrating on a 10 door day. That was a big deal. Eight days, six was pretty normal. Well, now between Murphy door, Utah and Murphy door, Kentucky, we do a door every six minutes. Right. So that's up to ten, around 10 an hour on a good day, you know? Yep. And that, that tells you something and that's on a standard singular shift. And then for most of Corona, you're running, you know, two shifts up to midnight, right? 
and we're still running with a huge backlog. And I promise to our customers that are watching or, and even if it's in the future, we're doing everything we can. I mean, Murphy Door's overall goal. So to give you an idea initially, back to the very beginning, our goal was to do just a hardware company. Mm -hmm. And then we had a bifolding bookcase. Then we came up with the flush mount bookcase, right? And then we decided, okay, what's next? Well, there's a lot of opportunities for, for Murphy Door and different concepts in space saving. And you see the Swiss furniture a lot. Well, as we move along, I think what would be great is to be able to have our doors ordered and delivered to that customer regardless of anything in three days. Whatever customization they want, that's cut, painted, built, packaged, and leaving our factory within three days. Not delivered, because that that's up to three-day delivery, five-day delivery. But if we can get it out of our facility in three days, we're going to be amazing at what we do. Well, every time we make progressions to get to this three-day lead time, our, our volume of customers are increasing so exponentially. We've been marching down this goal for now three years. Yeah. And here we sit with four times the equipment that we did three years ago, or more than that, and faster equipment, right? With the same lead times. With the same lead times, right? And here we we're, we keep ordering, and part of the handicap is for us is that we can't get the equipment fast enough to get ahead of the lead time. Yep. So what, when we order a CNC, you're six, eight months out. Well, you order a, a CNC, and of course, you're always worried about economic times, and you're saying, okay, we're going to pay cash for this or whatever it is. Well, you don't want to go order two CNCs yet because you don't know what eight months looks like from now. Well, by the time you get there, that CNC is already over its capacity for the day. Yep. So then you order another one or another freaking faster edge banner that does three times the speed or painting machines. And then, I mean, we were going to just do Utah, that painting and sanding machine for a while and test it and work it. Literally a month after we delivered it here, we ordered another half million dollars worth of painters and sanders yep. for Kentucky. Like, and we still can't keep our lead times up. We got up to 14 weeks. And I think we're down to five or six weeks now, which is okay. But not when you want to be three days. Well, what's it going to take? Well, we got Murphy Door, Utah, which, you know, our campus is about five and a half acres. And uh, we have Murphy Door, Kentucky, and that's another almost 35,000 square foot facility. Um, we're, we're, we're making some other moves right now inside. Uh, we're looking at the South a little bit. We've been debating Texas, right? Yep. Not to follow Joe Rogan, but yeah, you're part of the reason. Just opening it, right? And then, uh, or Florida, you know, uh, we also need something in the Northeast and then the Northwest. Yep. But definitely not Oregon or Washington, probably. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Where did, where did you say you want to be well, Oregon or Washington? Wherever that is, not there, Ken. Uh, that would be Oregon. Yeah, no, never. Then we're not going. We'll go to the Idaho border line. Just whatever it is not to be compliant with Ken. We'll just go to Coeur d'Alene. <laughs> yeah, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. That'll be better. So we just can't let Ken get his way. He's too new. So he hasn't earned his stripes yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm aiming to run this place in a few months. So. <laughs> well, see, he's got some high aspirations. <laughs> and if I keep sucking as bad as I do lately, then you know what? He wouldn't be surprised if he gets promoted. Um, anyway, yeah, we, it's, been a, it's been a ride. And I, but I don't know what else. We, we, we have a lot of uh, goals. Like, There's some stuff you guys will be seeing from Murphy Door that's going to be a lot of fun. And I can promise you, before we're done, you're going to be seeing furniture in three days. Yep. We're going to see... And boys are bad. Mm -hmm. All the Murphy bed boys out there, Murphy door in our beds, you're going to be seeing this. Yeah, so we're coming at you. It's going to be good. Yep. Uh, furniture Self, on demand. I mean, this uh, stress and the growth struggles are self-induced. We know. I mean, we're we're, we're pretty never, ambitious. <laughs> we're never, never complacent on you know sticking with one product and seeing if it you know running it out till the end. It's if you're not innovating, if you're not bringing out something special that drives people to want to come to our website or look at our products, if there's no drive for that, then nobody's going to come and our sales are never going to grow. And well, not to be braggart, but by the way, during Corona, we launched Murphy Ladder from a 3D conceptual idea in 2019 to a national rollout through all the Home Depot channels in 2020 mm -hmm. with what a hundred thousand plus units distributed between our channels 
I don't want to get off a tangent, Murphy Ladder. We're going to have a whole other show on Murphy Ladder just because of, of its amazing growth and its ability. I mean, we came up with an idea in our barn, had it developed, <laughs> got it produced, and rolled out in stores in eight months. Yep. Eight months. National rollout. So not very many people can say they went from zero to $10 million in sub a year on a brand new company. They're not a Murphy Door company. It's a Murphy Ladder company. It's on its own. But I probably, you know, we did all this during the door corona rollout nightmare of growth at 3x here and then trying to handle Murphy Ladder and a warehouse in California and a new product rollout through Home Depot with a vendor, you know, with a merchant that we didn't know very well that we still have not had the opportunity to get to know very well. I don't think he's seen the best of us yet. Um, we we've really been super lucky yep. and, and we ask a uh, lot of our teams. So, so you guys know our, our office team, as big as we are to tell you what kind of demands we have. Curtis, you have Curtis, the vice president. We have Sandra. That's the CFO of Murphy door and Murphy ladder and B and D real estate corporation, which is a commercial real estate piece for us. Ambra is her assistant. Ken over here. He's our uh, videographer, cinematographer. He's our head of branding and marketing. I don't, I don't know what title, director of creative. Is that yeah, what we're, sure. we're yeah, calling creative it? Director. You sound great. Creative director. Bam. Mic drop. <laughs> we have Scott and Peyton in our IT side, right? And then we have Spencer and Robert in our latter side, $10 million, two people over there. We have four people in customer service up, up front, and we have a customer service director. We run our shop with, I don't know, there's probably a total of 60 people here between all that, and we're heavy eight figures. Mm-hmm. Kind of crazy. Yeah, we definitely uh, wear wear a lot of hats and carry a lot of responsibility. But I think uh, we've chosen the right team for this because they all thrive on creating something and being a part of something bigger than themselves and contributing and being a beneficiary of the growth itself, like with the profit sharing. So people feel like, yeah, it is a lot to ask and we expect a lot, but we also try and give a bunch back so that they feel like their time is validated and that they're, you know, they're, they're building something big. You know, long story short is this whole ride is, is an interesting one. And I think anybody that's out there trying to start their own business and having aspirations and trying to achieve these goals, that's the whole thing of this podcast. Is it, and we wanted to bring in the Murphy Door story just because it's a pretty, we, I don't know that we did a great job in covering the, the, hurdles that were thrown in front of us right we had a lot of huge hurdles right there was no money there was no access to capital outside of this one stake president of mine that was willing to put twenty four thousand dollars, which in retrospect at the time was huge that was like half a year's salary right but now twenty four thousand dollars is not something that could help us really move the needle and I think when we're starting businesses we feel like we have to have these huge amounts of capital and I see these SaaS software programs and companies that do 100 and 200 and 300 million dollar rounds and i just scratch my head and i'm like what are they doing with that much money and i i just don't know that throwing that much capital at a startup or feeling that that we need that much capital to start seeing something up or to reach for goals that we may have in the back of our head is the right answer i would never let that get in the way of shooting for it you can still do it on fire wage you can still find friends, families, or fools to just entrust in you if you have the work and the drive, if you have the desire. You know, and, and what I want to do here in the in the next several podcasts is, is help people understand, one, that you don't let the hurdles get in the way. Two, help them find the steps. What are the orders? And we'll sit down and have conversations like, this is what we would do first. This is step two. This is kind of, the, or step one. This is what step one looks like. And these are the things that you're going to find in the middle of step one. Like, what's your idea? Well, how do you how do you fund it? How do you talk to friends, families, and fools? How do you share the you know the investment? How do you pay it back? Are they buying equity? Are they doing it on a loan? Are they doing it as a gift? Like, how, what do we expect out of that? And remember, as you get bigger and you end up in a place that you want to be, that you vision in your head, um, when you go back to those people that initially put money into you and trusted, be sure you treat them right, right? Yeah. Because otherwise they're going to be super angry and not going to have friends. And the goal would be, and, and I kind of gauge myself as like right now with John, 
we don't just have Murphy door with each other. Like I guarantee I could call and say, you want to invest in this next thing? He would do it tomorrow. Why? It's because we just did what we said. And he saw that we don't, we're not lazy. He would trust to invest in us as a team because he knows that we're willing to do 24 hours a day. He knows that we have no problem with it. He knows that we don't have to call him. Right. And, uh, I think everybody has that somebody in their life. They just don't know who that is to help them get their dreams off the ground. You know, I, ultimately it comes down to putting in the time, putting in the energy. And one of my favorite things I remind myself all the time. And, you know, sometimes I'll tell people is, you know, is that, is that saying that if you want to have what others don't, you have to be willing to do what others won't. So the only way for, 99% of businesses that are trying to get started is to be putting in more time, more energy and more resources into that business than it, the next person is. If you, if there's two door businesses right next to each other and one is just coasting and not doing anything, but the other person is devoting more time. He's there after hours. He's putting all of his profits that he's it's taking and putting it into marketing and, and bringing in the right people to help grow that business. They're obviously going to grow. So, you know, along those thoughts, 40 hours is really just a break even point. If, if you're lucky. For the majority of po the U.S. population, you put 40 hours in a week, all you're going to get is a 40 hour paycheck. Well, we all build our budget around a 40 hour paycheck. So, if you want to have a little bit left over, you probably ought to do more than 40 hours, mm -hmm. right? Whether it be inside your business or a different one or something. Um, you can't expect to get further ahead than if you don't give more than 40 hours. And if your goal is not to have more or give more or do more or have more freedoms, right? That's really what I look at the, so when I say more money doesn't make you happy, that's, that's true. It doesn't. But what it does do is I can go to Mexico when I want and I can go to France and I can go to vacation when I want. Right. And that's something I wasn't able to do anymore or before. Right. So now it's not as big a deal and it's not like you have to budget it out to go somewhere. And that's nice. But at the same time, if you want those freedoms to be able to do it, those hours still have to be paid, yep. right? You're either going to pay them 40 hours a week forever, or you can do 120 hour weeks for a third of the time. And then you'll have the, the other 66% to go do what you want to do. Hopefully, if you manage it correctly, it's not always going to work that way. Right. Yeah. And so that's just kind of how you, how we've done the ebbs and flows of, or how I've done it. So don't take that for granted for people that may seem like they're ultra successful. Like that's not fair. He's not that I'd ever have the fancy car, but it's not fair that he's driving a fancy car or lives in a big house. In my house, like yours is 1,100, mine's 1,550 square feet. I don't care about that side. But at the same time, if he has a month to take off, he's probably already submitted his hours. Right. They already paid their dues. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard for us to grasp. And I've been in those shoes too, where you look at someone like, man, that lucky son of a bitch. Like, well, I promise you, 99.9% .9 of the people that have that aren't lucky. No. They just have a grit to them that you just have to respect. Mm -hmm. You may not like the guy or girl for that matter. You may not, but man, you have to respect the grit. Yep. Because there's, there is more blood, sweat, and tears. When they say it, it's easy for us to just ride off what seems to be an overnight success that 30 years in the making. Yep. You don't see the behind the scenes stuff that, because it's Only, not sexy, yeah. just the car is, mm -hmm. right? Well, to everybody, I would say, you know, have those goals, shoot them. I mean, to shoot for them, go for the moon. Like there's, this is an extremely achievable opportunity for everyone, any business that they want. And I don't think any of them are bad ideas all the way. Um, it, there's just a different angle. And honestly, if you think it's a good idea, then more than likely there's more than one person that yep. thinks a good idea. Now, it, it may not be one that you think it is. That's another thing that we've seen. We we we've been we've had a lot of fun here. It's because we come up with concepts really fast. But I think one thing we're good at is killing shitty ideas. Yes. We'll have this ingenious idea and everybody will go to the dry, you know, or war room or whatever you want to call it. And we'll say, Hey, check this out. This is freaking phenomenal. We'll get all excited. And about four hours into the conversation, we're like, that was freaking stupid. Like, why do we ever think that would make any money? That was really a dumb idea. But you know, well, you have to be willing to kill what you think is your baby and just do the best you can to disqualify it. I think come up with great ideas and do everything you can to kill it. And if you can't kill it, then that's probably something you should go with. And and listening to people's, op you know, opinions open-minded and 
And in fairness to your friends and family that you're asking, some of them don't have the authority to vote. And I know that sounds probably super ignorant, but I have some of my own family, and you probably know who you are, just kidding, <laughs> that I would never ask you what I think, what your opinion is. Like, just wouldn't. Like, I don't appreciate it. I don't respect it. And it's not that I don't respect the person, but I've seen life decisions that they've made. And whatever it is that they're doing, I probably want to do the opposite, right? Is that mean? No. Or is that, that's probably mean. No. I don't know. I'm just saying that they, you've seen what those people do and how they work and what they're, where they're at in their life. And I would never ask those guys what their feelings are of a product. Now, I would take it to people that I truly appreciate, and it may not be one, but 10 of them, and see if the larger majority think it's a good idea or if the larger majority think it's a bad idea. And I would highly suggest if the larger majority think it's a bad idea, really think it out and keep thinking of ideas that the majority think is a good idea. And it's okay to have ideas shot down. You shouldn't have one out of one. You should have one out of 10 or one out of 50. Good ideas are generally pretty far apart. Yeah. And depending on who you're asking, some people are just going to, because they don't really care or they don't want to put the And they don't want you to be successful. Or they want to be successful. Or they'll just say, yeah, that's a great idea. That's cool. That's great. Even though it's a shitty idea. And they're, you're going to spend all this time working on some project that somebody is too nice to say that's a bad idea. Back to make sure you ask the right people. Ask the right people. You know, ask for honest opinions and open it. And another way to do it is sometimes point out the ideas that you think are bad about it out the gate and then let them disqualify your thoughts that are bad. So a way to lighten up some of those conversations to say, I really like this idea I came up with, but this is the things I think suck. What else sucks? And then they may say, ah, I don't think that sucks as bad as you think, but here's some other ones because at least you've opened to criticism, right? Right. That's a hard deal too. And and I honestly love constructive criticism. It, it's been a, a skill set in itself. And I think you're great at it. That's what I was going to tell you earlier. You're really good at what you're doing. I think you have a really good ability to listen to people and they're a lot more caring. You're good at constructive criticism. I think you, you line up your ducks really well once you hear it. And I think... You know, I, that's something that's taken me a long time to learn. But if, as long as you can approach a conversation, I don't know, but I'm going to find out and then get a team around you that has a bunch of th concepts or understand where your objective is. And then people that may have already ob accomplished those objectives and get them on your team, even for phone calls and listen and act on their words. I mean, it's easier and better, I believe, to act on what they suggest before disqualifying what they suggest and keep acting in the way you're acting because you'll end up with a better result. Right. Generally speaking, they've been down that dirt road already. They don't need to do it, yep. but you've been really good at that. Thank you. So well, I don't, I don't know what else. I, I really think that uh, we'd love to have people bring in ideas and help us help you. We'd love to be participating in some of your guys's growth. We want to answer questions and we will build this platform out that's able to kind of say, hey, step one, step two, step three, step four, if this is something you're interested in, open it up for dialogue and comments at the bottom. If you like it, just comment right yeah. there at the bottom of the video. Let us know what you'd like us to discuss. Let us know who you may want us to ask. We have, we're pretty fortunate in the people with the contacts that we can get a hold of now. So if there's people you want us to talk to or bring in or whatever, please, please let us know. I think it's a smart podcast idea because <clears throat> unfortunately you get a lot of these businesses that want to start and they have great ideas, but there's no resources out there really that take them step by step on what to be aware of, how to fast track it, what, you know, obstacles to avoid, you know, these pitfalls that these bigger businesses that have already gone through and maybe aren't sharing that information. You know out. why? They're guarding it. Yes. The people don't want people to succeed. Right. I'm on the other side of it. I think we all are. Mm -hmm. We want everybody to be successful so much that they'd leave even Murphy door. Like that's not what we want, but we want more than them staying is them really growing. Right. So back to what you're saying, people hard are harbor and guard the data that it got them to where they're at. They feel it's a super competitive strategic move to me. And I'm sure what you were getting at is competition's good. It is. It pushes us. Mm -hmm. 
It pushes, it, it helps us grow. It helps others. It gives us more to live for than just ourselves. Um, so back to your thing. Anyway, yeah. I really like it. Yep. I think it's, you know, nobody, nobody really lays it out on a blueprint of how, how do you get into Rotten Depot, for and example? May, yeah. and maybe, how do you get into retailers? And maybe the steps that we took are not, I mean, maybe they're the backwards and they're not a wise way to have done things, but for us, it's worked and we've been successful with it. And maybe, you know, people are going to look at it and go, yeah, that's really a stupid way to do it, but there's a million ways to skin a cat, right? Yeah. And I think there's, in saying that now that we know what we know, some of the acts that we did first, horrible. We, we would have done it different now. Yeah. And we, we could get to mass market a lot better. That's like true. anymore now, when people said they have the contacts, take it serious. Cause we've bypassed some people that said, Hey, what I can do in a couple of days, it's going to take you two years. If you just let me help you. Cause I have the phone numbers that it takes. We discredited those people that said that. Remember we're like, yeah, yeah. contacts aren't that important. We have an idea. Eh, no contacts are important. Yep. And we've seen that if you have the right phone number to dial, if you've had the right advisors to teach you and you've had the right lessons that you've learned, then you can really accelerate your growth. And as long as you're taking and applying those conversations and lessons, then you can really shorten that learning curve. But what we want to do is help you do that, help you take your dream and help you get to where it's going. I mean, we can look at it as investment opportunities, conversations, whatever it is, but we want you guys to reach out and talk to us and help us help you, help us come up with context. If we don't have it, we'll look for it. We'll find the right people that'll help answer those questions. And and honestly, this is a super selfish move when it comes to this podcast because it, it helps us reflect and it is helping us grow. Just having these kind of conversations. Yep. So yep, I agree. We'd love to have you along the way. And uh, we'll go through this one on one. Again, that was Curtis. Vice President Murphy Dorn. I'm Jeremy. Thanks for joining us. And Ken Merrill on the mics. Yeah.